Welcome on up to the Parashas this morning. Let's all stand. Let's give the Lord praise and worship this morning. Come on.
again this morning. Be all you can be was the recruiting slogan of the United States Army for over 20 years. It encompasses everything about human potential that is needed to succeed in the greatest army in the world. Now, as a veteran of the United States, God bless Air Force, I prefer aim high. <coughs> because if you aim for the stars and you fall short, you can at least capture the moon on the way down. But I digress. Psalms 139, verse 14 says, and it might be very familiar to most of you, I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. I like the translation I read from the Message Bible that says, Thank you, Almighty God. You are breathtaking, body and soul. I am marvelously made. I worship in adoration. What a creation. Hebrews 1 verse 10 says, And you, Lord, laid the foundations of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. So learning this simple truth, that our potential to be great is great, and that's my subtitle this morning, as great as your potential. You can be sure of that. It's one of the very important lessons to be learned in the school of life is that you actually have far more potential than you think you do. And it sounds like a cliche, but let me remind you that a cliche is a cliche because it's repeated so often because it's true. And so it may sound like a cliche, but it, it is true. It's like King David, as he wrote in the Psalms, we need to understand and realize that we are marvelous creatures. That we are fearfully and wonderfully made. I'm going to make that case this morning. The question I had for myself during this revelation is, what have I truly done with my life's potential? That's a question we all need to ask. See, there's a hidden agenda behind this monkey business we call evolution. Evolution is all about minimizing the, the divine spark of the, create, of the creation, us, by the creator of God. And evolution is devolving the masterful and genius creation of God into an accidental process of nature. And nothing special, nothing divine, that is a travesty. So that is the sum total, by the way, of everything I will say about evolution today. I'm hoping that after this message you'll see the theory of evolution for the nonsense that it is. Consider this, mankind has developed and invented some amazing equipment. I mean, amazing equipment that the average you and I, Joe and Jane in society have no idea how they work or how they came up with them. But they've still never been able to create anything even remotely compared to the equipment that God created called the human body. Just think about it for a moment. I wanna go through some things that will help you understand exactly how amazing we are. Uh, let's talk about supersized molecules. Practically everything we experience is made up of molecules, and these vary in size from simple pairs of atoms, uh, like an oxygen molecule, to complex organic structures. And, and, and the, biggest model, uh, the biggest molecule in nature resides in your body. It is chromosome one. A normal human cell has 23 pairs of chromosomes in its nucleus, each a single, very long molecule of DNA. Chromosome one is the biggest, containing around 10 billion atoms in order to pack in the amount of information that is encoded in the molecule. 10 billion atoms inside chromosome one. Each <laughs> nucleus is con it contains uh, uh, it contains 23 pairs. Uh, that just blows my mind. <laughs> Let's look at the atom count for a minute. It's hard to grasp just how small the atoms that make up your body are until you take a look at the sheer number of them. And remember, no atom touches one another. They're polarized. And so an adult is made up of around 7 octillion atoms. That's 27 zeros after that, seven, ladies and gentlemen. Octillion, seven 
octillion atoms in your body. You have built-in air conditioning. The average person uh, has an air conditioning system that develops 2,500 calories a day, enough to boil 25 pots of coffee. The human brain has a thermostat with its own nervous system. It can, it's in continuous contact with every part of the body simultaneously. If part of the body gets too hot or too cold, signals are sent to the control center to modify the blood vessels of the skin to contract or dilate in order to give off more or less heat as may be required. No air conditioning system has ever been designed by mankind that comes anywhere near to as perfect as the human body's built-in air conditioning system. Let's talk about our electrical system of the human body. It's beyond comprehension. The human brain contains 10 million neurons, nerve cells, each of which is capable of operating a 0.07 volt potential. The eyes are connected with the brain by 300,000 separate and private, to put it crudely, telephone lines. We look at a uh, base of flowers, thousands of separate and distinct messages are sent to our brain telling us the shape, the size, the depth of each flower, the vivid variations in color, up to 16 million colors, discernible, uh, and so forth. Digital photography comes close to matching the human eyes, automatically making adjustments to produce the best image. However, each of our eyes contains 100 million nerve cells working together perfectly to allow us to see close up, to see at a distance, to see in vibrant, perfect colors, a feat still not matched uh, uh, by mankind's genius. We all know that the image reflected to the brain is upside down. And the brain makes it right side up in our thinking. But if you were to wear glasses that turn everything in the world upside down, after a few days, your brain would make sense of the distorted image and turn everything right side up again in your mind in a double negative, a double, double reverse uh, sensation so that you are seeing everything right. God is, 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 is making a very important priority. And you see things the way they're supposed to be seen. That you absolutely have the ability to dis discern and to take distorted reality and turn it right side up to make sense. Are you hearing me? Amen. Our limbs. Inventors have used all their skill to develop artificial limbs, but the very best efforts cannot even remotely match the functionality and ability of our own natural limbs. Two hands. Two feet in perfect synchronization. No robot's able to do that. It's just, it's not, that's their biggest problem. And uh, the ears. The average piano has a keyboard with 88 keys. However, we have a keyboard with 1,500 keys in each ear. So sensitive that in a completely soundproof room, we can actually hear the blood flowing through our own veins and vessels in our body. That's the sensitivity of the ear. How about the heart? The workhorse of the human body is the heart. In the body, there are approximately 100,000 miles of blood vessels. 100,000 miles of blood vessels. A vast system through which the heart keeps the blood flowing regularly. In order to accomplish this task, a normal heart beats about 100,000 times a day. Normally, we never have to worry about our heart beating uh, or being overworked uh, because the heart rests one sixteenth out of every second, totaling six hours of rest a day or about 20 years of rest during a normal lifetime. That's fascinating. One more thing about the brain, most wonderful of all. It, it, it completely defies any comparison. It gives us the ability to think and to reason, to remember and to forget, to plan to be spontaneous. The only creatures on earth sophisticated enough to ask the question, who made us and why, is the human being made in God's own image. 
asking the questions, looking at the universe, looking at the stars, looking at the sky, looking at night, uh, as far as the eye can see. And we ask the questions, philosophical in nature, who made us and why? John chapter 1, verse 1 through 3 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Everything was made through Him, and without Him, nothing was made that was made. So the question today then becomes, who made us and why? Everything includes us, you and me. We can know for certain that the person behind our lives, our Creator, is Almighty God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. As we realize uh, that God planned us and made us, we become aware of the existence of a very personal God. And as we begin to use and develop our lives, church, if we'll be intellectually honest, we become more certain of God. As you get yourself in situations, circumstances, troubles, trials, storms of life, we begin to see God working out our lives in us. Thereby, we become more certain that we can accomplish His will, that we become, that we can become all that He has created us to be. We can be all we can be. Amen. Amen. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are His workmanship. We are created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You are a piece of work that is said. But this is God's work. You are God's epic poem of creation, I like to say. One man described it. When the Apostle Paul says that you are God's workmanship, don't think of your, uh, you know, your clunky seventh grade shop class project. That was no masterpiece. That was a hot mess. Think instead of the greatest works of art and epic poetry in all humankind, all human history. His workmanship uses the Greek word poema, where we get our English word poem or poetry. As in his poema, we are his epic poema. <laughs> of creation, his divine poetry, his masterpiece. That's how God considers us to be. That's how he describes us as a masterpiece. Glory to God. We are his workmanship. We are his poem. Amen. There are four, however, there are four main obstacles towards becoming all we can be, <laughs> being all we can be that he has created us to be. That there are four things to get in the way. There's many more than four, but I've only got time this morning for four. Number one, self-pity. Number two, false pride. Number three, a martyr complex. Number four, a sense of inferiority. These things are obstacles uh, to becoming all that we can become in Christ. Amen. Number one, self-pity. Self-pity shows a lack of trust in God. God responded by reminding Elijah that God was still with him and that things were not as bad as Elijah made them to sound when he was hiding in a cave feeling sorry for himself. Self-pity is a curse that will keep us down. It will steal our natural human motivation to succeed. One of the easiest things in the world to do is to feel sorry for ourselves. You've heard often people say, uh, what's this, what's this, I don't know what it is. It's the world's smallest violin. <laughs> and, and people make fun of self-pity, but we do it all the time. We feel sorry for ourselves on a regular basis. When we are disappointed or defeated, it is soothing to indulge in the narcotic of self-pity, the overdose of self-sympathy. Self-pity will destroy our determination and rob us of our self-respect. And I would challenge that most drug addicts, most heroin addicts, most meth addicts have started and continued their drug use because of an overwhelming uh, overdose of self-pity. That they think that somehow they are singled out by the world as a victim. They're singled out by the world to be dumped on, and they, they go and escape their problems and find a different reality because they're just uh, sad 
about the reality they're in. They're filled with self-pity. When we begin to say to ourselves over and over again that Almighty God has promised to be with us, has promised to comfort us, we can begin to live again. We can begin to focus ourselves on Him. We start to ask ourselves, why have our lives become so bogged down? Is it really because of circumstances beyond our control? Is that really the issue? Has God really let us down? Absolutely not. And you know he hasn't. The answer is no. It is simply that we have not done our best. I know, I know, I know. I've done my best. I hear it all the time. I've done my best, Pastor. No, you haven't, number one. You have that's let's let's lay that down. You haven't done your best. I'm, I'm not sure any of you have ever, ever reached your best potential in anything that you've tried. The answer is simply we have not done our best. Truly, it's that simple. We have not pressed in and done our best. We have not suffered yet unto blood, as the Bible describes it. Definition of the phrase do or try one's best is be all you can be. It is do all one can to do one's utmost, to try one's absolute hardest, to make every single effort, leaving nothing out, to do all one can to give one's all 100% completeness to a project or task. That kind of lays it out there for us, doesn't it? That we could be so awesome if we would do that on the things that are important, but we don't, or we rarely do. No matter what has happened in our lives, church, we can know that there is something special in life prepared for us. We don't have to feel sorry for ourselves. We can shake off that dust. We can rise up, come on somebody, and we can get it done. We have it within our power through Christ, amen, to make it happen, amen, to, to be all that we can be. And that's not a cliche. That's standing up and saying, you know what? I'm tired of feeling sorry for myself. <coughs> There's something in life prepared for me. Something meaningful, something impactful, something of purpose, something of destiny, mm -hmm. and something great. And with God's help, I'm going to find what that is. Amen. Obstacle two, false pride. Pride, few people can claim mastery over it. What is pride? Usually we define pride as something that exists in someone else other than us. That's how we describe pride. Pride is that thing that exists in so-and-so. Uh, he's prideful. But according to the dictionary, pride means to act arrogantly, to assume a high opinion of one's worth, conceit. Mary Lewis put it best when she said, pride is the idolatrous worship of self and is the national religion of hell. Come on, somebody. Pride is the national religion of hell. This is one of the great enemies of our soul. It keeps us from admitting to others that our attitudes and our actions have been wrong, that we've got it wrong, that we're thinking wrong, that we're on the wrong foot. It prevents us from confessing to ourselves our own weaknesses, admitting where we're failing. Amen. Our admitting our mistakes keeps us from properly estimating our areas of failure and allows us to overestimate our spirituality, thus getting us into big trouble. When we overestimate our spirituality, we think we can handle situations that we truly can't handle. And we take ourselves into areas that are dangerous for our walk with God. But we go there because we've overestimated our spirituality. We've overestimated our strength in God. We've overestimated our ability to actually stay uh, apart from the world and, and consecrated to God. Pride gives us a false sense of values. It closes the door to a blessed life for every one of us. Pride tells us that we are self-sufficient. It destroys our humanity because part of humanity is to make mistakes. Part of humanity is to, be, uh, uh, is to have fault 
that that fault is turned into a great growth lesson that brings us further. It's mistakes and failures that cause us to realize what we can't do, what we don't know, where we lack in our training, what we need to work on. And that brings us to a whole new level in growth. It also destroys our humility, where we find ourselves trying to make do, trying to succeed on our own, with our, uh, with our only our own strength, forgetting God's promise and lo, I am with you always. Pride blocks God's power to succeed in your life. Pride blocks God's power, God's ability. God is shut off from succeeding in your life, from speaking in your life, from moving in your life, from doing things with you uh, that he desires to do to make you better, to, so you can be all you can be. Pride blocks that. Number three, obstacle. Three, a martyr complex. A martyr complex is an idea that so many of us have, the troubling makeup of this is that we think that our issues, our problems are so unique, our circumstances are so unique and nobody could possibly understand what we've gone through. It is so very easy to feel that we are carrying burdens that are greater than anyone else that has to bear and to parade in public our sorrows and our difficulties to develop an utmost insane desire for sympathetic attention. Therefore, a uh, martyr complex always pours itself out in self-pity. Obstacle number one. They are related. This is where we get self-pity. We begin to think that everything we're going through is unique, that ours is, our life is harder than yours, that, that our circumstances are worse than yours. The reason I can't make my marriage work, Pastor, is because you don't understand how bad my marriage is. You don't, you don't have somebody like I do as a partner. You don't, you don't understand what we're going through. You don't get where we come from. So just as some people become addicted to drugs or alcohol, others become addicted to sympathy. To approve, you ever heard of approval addiction? Addicted to approval and to the praise of others. When we become conscious of a sense of purpose or a mission that God has given us with the support of the power of God of heaven, we begin to fulfill that purpose or that mission. Those burdens uh, become enemies and we overcome. That with the promise of Jesus, that we are more than overcomers, that we don't have to fall victimhood to circumstances in our life, that we are not just overcomers, we are greater than overcomers. There is nothing a Christian can't overcome. That's what separates us out from the world. Born again Christians have the power of God, the transcendent nature of Jesus Christ to overcome things greater than themselves. We do not have to fall under the burdens of self-pity, under the burdens of pride, or the sense that we have been singled out by all of heaven and hell to be persecuted. Stop it. Stop it. Stop that mentality. You've not been singled out. You're marvelously made. You're wondrously made. You're wonderfully made. Listen, you are the epic poem. You're the workmanship of God. You are his prime creature, his, 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 the, the apple of his eye. You are his opus, man. You are the one that he has created completely individually. You have, you have fingerprints that are different than anybody else's in the world, more than seven billion people, and yours are different than anybody else's, not so the police can track you down, so that God has made you unique, so that you would know he took special care in each and every one of us, amen, now the police have used it to track people down, but that's not what it's for <laughs> we don't have to fall for burdens of self-pity, we are marvelously made, number four obstacle, is a sense of inferiority the basic cause of inferiority this morning is when we make the constant comparison of ourselves with others. And I have spent a lifetime fighting this battle 
as many of you have. I've spent a lifetime looking at somebody else and saying, they do that so much better than me. They're so much better at that than me. It just drives me crazy, and I must not be doing very well at all. That somehow, no matter what, we don't measure up. Many times, this includes with it the misguided view that we have done all that we can do, and we're simply inferior. See, that's what, it, when, when we become lazy, when we become comfortable, when we do not press in, when we do not work to get something done, when we do not take the time, amen, to put in the work that somebody else put in, and we look at them, and, and then we begin to think, we come to a, an insane conclusion that it's not that we can't do that, it's that we're simply inferior, and that's a lie from hell. You're not inferior. Amen. That's a lie from hell. I've learned through the years when I am envious of somebody, and come on, I've struggled with envy as you have, and when I'm envious of someone and catch myself comparing, I find that many times the areas I'm envious of are areas that they work excessively hard at mastering in their own lives. And I, in turn, have failed to put in the work necessary to succeed at their level. Are you hearing me, church? Amen. Many of you are not necessarily inferior. You're just lazy, amen? You just have not taken the time to achieve at the level they have achieved. And you, it's not that you can't achieve that. And it's not that you're inferior to them. You just not have put in the work that they have put in. When we are convinced that we have a purpose in life. Church, listen to me. I've been on this for a week or so. I've been dealing with this since we've been locked down with coronavirus. I think it's very important for those that are not normal church members that are listening in to hear these things that I'm preaching. And so that's why I've kind of gone this direction. But when we are convinced that we have a purpose in life, that God has uniquely given us the necessary talents and abilities and even the transcendent, uh, uh, being able to tap into God's transcendency, which is above the natural, which is supernatural. It's something that God gives us that allows our talents to be multiplied uh, beyond what we can think or ask. Uh, amen. That God has uniquely given us the necessary talents, the necessary abilities, and he is uh, helping us accomplish that purpose, then no matter what anyone else has accomplished or achieved, no matter what anyone else is doing, church, listen to me, there comes into our heart a sense of personal satisfaction that we're being used of God, that we're rising up to a level of commitment that eliminates envious comparisons and can literally set you free, doing the will of God. Being in God's purpose, walking your destiny, amen, reaching toward the transcendent, amen, becoming a born-again Christian all the time, not Sundays and, uh, 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 and holidays, but all the time, amen, pushing your commitment to God to a level beyond your own intellect, to a level that says, you know what, I want to get as close to God as humanly possible. Enoch said that. Enoch was so close to God, the Bible says that God just took him. Just took him home. He was already so close. He was more heaven than he was earth. So God just took him home. Uh, a, a glorious, glorious story in the word of God. So I'm going to close with this thought. Imagine with me this morning, if you will for a moment, that if we eliminate these four obstacles... And I've outlined here this morning all enemies of life, of your life. A marvelous change can take place. And in Christ Jesus, we can become all we can be. All that he has created us to be. We ought to thank God that we have the transcendent ability tonight, that, or this morning, that if we will trust God, and we will work hard. We can rise to great heights. And the only thing that will limit us is our own lack of industriousness, our own lack of hard work, our own lack of ability to press in, our own lack of character, our lack of attitudes, our lack of a mindset to success. A person once told the late great American inventor, Thomas Edison said, you're a genius. He replied, before I was a genius, I was a slave. 
And there's no easy <coughs> pathway to greatness, church. Only hard work. Thankfully, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. We are made for the task. Are you hearing me? We were created to be all that we can be. That's a creation. Amen. God has done it. We need to trust him. Trust God. The reason that most people fail to meet their potential is they've thrown God out of the mix. They think they can do it in their own intellect, their own education. Listen, I've got lots of education. Education didn't get me here. Amen. The Spirit of God the power of God, amen, the relationship with God over 37 years is what brought me to where I am in Christ now. Amen. I've got nine years of education, but that's not what, <laughs> that's not what brings me to the level that God is bringing me to. We need to trust God. See, there are sins and sinful habits that block our spiritual progress. How many would say that? Before God can move to deliver you from them and forgive them in you, we must confess them. We must forsake them. Things like our selfishness gets in the way of where God wants to take us. Things like our unwillingness to cooperate with the disciplines of discipleship. I said our unwillingness to cooperate with the disciplines of discipleship and become what God intended for you to be at the very beginning, hallelujah, before you even understood destiny. There are many things which are not harmful in and of themselves, but are they expedient, the Bible asks. But they have a deceptiveness, a deceptiveness built into them like entertainment, like idleness, like the stay-at-home order, danger. I'm kind of afraid America's not going to be able to reopen and go back to work, as everybody's talking about on the news. Because I'm afraid that many people in their stay-at-home order have learned how to stay up very late and sleep in till noon. And we're going to have to work hard at getting back into a system, back into a, uh, back into a work ethic. That will make us pro uh, uh, progress again. It will make us uh, able to complete the tasks that are given to us. Amen. That stay-at-home order danger is that we will get lazy. Amen. I, I tell you what, I, my, I don't even wear my Fitbit now. The steps just are not helping me. Amen. I'm not, I'm not I used to do uh, 10 to 15,000 steps a day just on a normal day. On a preaching day, I'd be upwards of 20,000. But now, right now, I'm at 6,000 if I can help it because I work behind a desk. I own a company, and we do advertising, and I work behind a computer. And I want to tell you something. I understand the stay-at-home danger is real. And so there are some even good things that can become a problem. Too much of a good thing can work to hinder being our very best. And these things must be ordered. They must be prioritized. And they must be surrendered. Become all that God has created you to be. Be all you can be this morning. And begin to assault these things that are tearing you down. Let's bow our heads. Close our eyes for just a moment. Wherever you are, looking at the screen, don't, don't shut the laptop and walk away. Don't turn it off. Don't go into the kitchen. Just stay right where you are. Because Jesus loves you, he died for your sins. I would never preach a message without giving you an opportunity to respond to it. There are many that are struggling. I've talked to several throughout the week that are struggling. I've tried to work with them and try to help them. The best thing that you can do, amen, to continue to stay on track this morning is to be paying attention to every single one of these live streams. Uh, uh, this morning, uh, tonight at 6.30, Wednesday night at 7. Uh, uh, take notes, study them through the week, continue to read your Bible, continue to pray, continue to lay hold of God. But the reality is, is that there are some of you that are not right with God. And I'll tell you, if I saw a plague 
that came upon the whole globe where the, the, almost the entire planet is in a stay-at-home order. I would think something's happening in the last days and I need to pay attention. I would think it might be time to get serious with God. If you're not saved, if you're not born again, if you're not right with God, listen, the world is a liar. The world will overpromise and underdeliver. But Jesus Christ promised his promises with his very blood. Dying on the cross. Breaking his body for you. So that you can have eternal life. You get joy, peace, love, unconditional. You get, you get eternal life. Families that stay together. I can't even imagine my life 37 years serving God. I just can't imagine what it would be like. If I was the same old time kind of yeah, I was back in the day. It's amazing to see what God has done. If you need to be honest with yourself, that unless you ask Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior, unless you turn away from this world and follow Him, unless you begin your journey this morning, your life might very well be in peril. And it's simple, it's a prayer. And then we take it from there. This is the beginning. This isn't salvation. This is the decision to live your life for God. A decision to turn away from the world and toward the cross. This is the decision to be saved. And Jesus will do the work and has done the work. He's done the work on the cross and will do the work in your life from here on. Save his prayer with Grab the hand of your family member. Bow your head. Be serious before the Lord. Say this with me. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you died for me and rose from the dead so I could have eternal life. I come to you humbly asking for your forgiveness, asking you to come into my heart to forgive me of my sins, to help me to build a new life, to give me the faith, the wisdom, the strength, and, and, and to build my character to move forward from this place. I desire you, Jesus, in my life, your future for me, your destiny for me, and I need the strength to walk that path. I ask you to save me, to set me free, and to live inside. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Maybe you didn't pray that prayer because you're already saved. I just want to take a moment to address those that are already born again Christians. And I want to remind you that you too understand, you understand maybe a little bit more of how awesome God is. But you also struggle with self-pity, false pride, a murder complex, a sense of inferiority. These are struggles that we battle daily. And God is speaking to you that there are arenas in your life that are trying to rip off the greatness that God wants to do for you and in you. And we have to be aware we need to break the spirit of pride, break the curse of self-pity, drop the martyr complex, serving nobody, and understand that you are not inferior, that you are wondrously made. Thank you very much for tuning in this morning. As uh, all of you maybe take a moment at an altar call in your home, an altar in your home you've set up around where you're serving God, where you're watching this, you might want to be kneeling on your knees, praying before the Lord, laying hold of God about what God has shown you this morning. I do want to remind you tonight at 6.30, I'll be back live streaming from our church on Union Avenue uh, in New Philadelphia. 
I want to remind you, amen, that it will be open sometime in May, I hope. I'm praying we'll let you know. We'll keep you tuned in. We do have tomorrow night a Bible study on Zoom. Uh, and so you can download the, the app uh, to your phone or to your uh, tablet uh, or to your computer uh, if you have a camera. And so you can uh, download that uh, app, Zoom, and uh, then you can uh, uh, pay attention. We'll, we'll post our link once we get it tomorrow. We'll post the link on Facebook and on our website, and you can click on that link and join into our Bible study. And we'll be doing that tomorrow night at 7 o'clock. I'll be teaching that. I think I'm going to deal with some last days stuff. I'm going to be fielding some questions. I'm going to be praying for some people. And so we're going to believe God for that. It's going to be a lot of fun. And so we'll go about an hour. And uh, we'll do that tomorrow night. And so it'll be good to see all of your faces. And maybe some of you that I haven't seen your faces uh, maybe for years. I see some people uh, from my high school that are uh, tuning into the live stream all the time. And it'd be great to see you uh, again on Bible study. And so you can uh, join with us. And uh, that'd be a great time. So that's tomorrow night. Also, we have obligations. We have a church building. We have uh, bills that we have to pay. We have uh, things that we have to take care of. And, and you have obligations to Christ. You have an obligation to tithe, to give offerings, to be generous, to allow a tenth of your income uh, beyond to, to be given to the help of the work of the Lord. Uh, where you're being fed, that's where you give. And if you're here on this live stream uh, uh, and you're a church member, you know what you need to do. If you're not a church member, but you're watching this weekly because you're getting fed, then you can help us. You can give something before the Lord. You can take part in that. If you want to give online, you can click on the link there on Facebook page that we're live streaming. You can click on the link on our website, phohio.com, pottershouseohio.com. You can go there. You can find the link right on the top on your, uh, your cell phone. Uh, it, it, it's a mobile version, so it looks like an app. And the online giving is right there as you enter. Uh, so you can do that. You can also send a check to, uh, or cash to P.O. Box 243 uh, in uh, New Philadelphia, Ohio, uh, 44663. You can also get that address again later uh, on our website, pottershouseohio.com. So uh, uh, as well as we have a lockbox on the interior uh, alcove of our entrance to our church building, 335 Union Avenue Northwest in New Philadelphia, you can put uh, uh, money in that lockbox. It is very secure. Uh, we'd be blessed in any way. Thank you very much for tuning in. God bless you. Have a great day. We'll see you tonight at 630. Amen.